Okay, it's uh, it's really cool to come to Finland, especially after being cooped up for three years. And now it's like, like coming to another planet. It's such a strange place. And the ocean is full of islands and the land is full of lakes. So it's a very high degree fractal. It, it, it's, uh, anyway, today I'm gonna to be talking about, uh, well, there's three things that I do. I'm a mathematician, I'm a, a, a novelist, and I've been a painter for about 20 years now. And so I'm gonna to try to blend those three things together today. And uh, let's see. Uh, where's the clicker? Is this it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, one of the things, sometimes if you end up being a mathematician, you often are thinking about things like that when you're little. And I was, a lot of kids, when they first hear about the idea of infinity, they get really interested in that. And that also struck me. And I would, I would imagine falling down an endless endless hole kind of like in Alice in Wonderland when she falls down and uh, I like thinking about it and that there would be sort of balconies and there'd be pretty women waving to me and cool little aliens and friendly people and I would just do that for quite a while and then uh, later I wrote a novel called The Hollow Earth and one of the big scenes in there is they go down to Antarctica and they find there's a place where Antarctica, the ice is very thin and they break it. And then they're falling down uh, through the hole in the Earth's crust. And uh, turns out the Earth's crust is only about 2000 miles thick and inside it's, it's hollow like a tennis ball. So I had fun writing that scene. Now, one of the things about writing and painting and math is I can visualize things in mathematics, but then I want to see them. And so I'll write about them and I'll paint them. And something I should also mention, uh, I put most of this talk online on my blog. So rudyrucker.com slash blog. So if English is your second language and you can't understand a fucking word that I'm saying, then you can always go read it on the blog tonight. Say, oh, that's what he was saying, okay. Now, uh, that first painting I showed you, it, it wasn't very good, but I've been painting for about 20 years now. And this one I consider to be a better painting. And this is also in the hollow earth. And uh, I had these flying creatures there. They're a cross between a shrimp and a pig. So their rear is like a shrimp and their front is like a pig. So they're called shrigs naturally. And they, they fly by combustible gas that comes from their rear. They light it and they can move around quite rapidly. And uh, the shrig here, there's those little creatures next to him and I'm calling them krakens. And they're again, a math thing where, uh, I mean, I'm always exploring worlds. And for me, it's kind of the same world. It's the science fiction world, the math world. And there's a type of fractal. I was always interested in the Mandelbrot set. For people my age, when the Mandelbrot set first showed up, it was just really an incredible thing. And then you can get to higher order Mandelbrot sets, and uh, cubic ones, which in my opinion, it's really not a enough attention was ever paid to those higher order ones. And I, I found one that's called the Rudy set. And it's a, you can look that up. And it's a combination of a infinitely many cubic Mandelbrot sets. And this cute little pattern there, it's a, it's a very cute little thing like a Mandelbrot set, but it's just sort of like a little horsey. And so they're in, I threw them in, actually they're not even in the novel, but they made it into this painting. Now, uh, let's see, I'm talking about writing. So people often will say to me, what is it like to write? And this is a, a painting of me some years ago in Lynchburg, Virginia, I had, I'd been teaching at Randolph-Macon and they actually, they fired me. I didn't get to keep that job. And, uh, but then I said, well, if I'm just sick of trying to get jobs as a teacher. I'm going to quit. I'm going to be a freelance writer. And, you know, I was pulling down about $8,000 a year. 
So it, it worked for a while. And then I went back to teach at San Jose State, teach computer science. But while I was a freelance writer, I had this little office in an abandoned building. And I had my old IBM Selectric typewriter. This was also old forgotten technology. If you wanted to do symbols, you could put a different head on the thing and you could have the symbol head. And uh, notice there's a small UFO in there. And uh, I'm wearing a vest as I like to do, and that's me. And, uh, and again, I say writing, one of the things I'm going to be talking to about today is that you can't really plan what you're going to write about. It's more like you get into it and it becomes like a dream and you're in the dream and you're writing about what you're seeing and you're walking around inside the dream. Now, another aspect of writing that people don't really talk about as much as they should is that, again, I'm going to show you a mathematical proof that well, even in principle, you can't know what you're doing when you're writing, it's the hardest thing you can possibly do if you're doing it right, because you're using your, your entire computational power. And when you're doing that, you can't, you can't go beyond that, but you need something else. And I call that the muse. It's a, you know, a very old idea, an artist or writer, the muse comes and helps you. And the muse isn't always there, you know, she might show up or she might not. And you need to sort of have an environment where the muse would feel like coming to visit you. I mean, you need to be working on your project. You can't just be lying around drunk, you know, and you have to be actively trying to write the book or, or do the painting. And, uh, and then when you're lucky, the muse will show up and uh, she'll show you what to do. And this is a painting of the muse. And uh, this is a spot where we like to go and uh, we live near, Santa Cruz, California now, and this is on the cliffs there. It's a pelican there flying by. Now, I just want to jump back. The first thing I talked about was my childhood thoughts about flying, falling down an endless hole. And this is another sort of falling down a hole painting. And this is something I did quite recently. And this, uh, this relates to a novel I was writing then called Juicy Ghosts. And I wrote this uh, shortly before the, the 2020 election and Trump was talking about coming back in and getting a third term. And uh, so I wrote a novel about assassinating him. <laughs> but curiously, I couldn't get any of my publishers to publish it. So I had to self-publish it and I did a Kickstarter and I got 17,000 bucks, you know. And I worried, I was paranoid Trump and the Secret Service would come after me, but all they did was send me a fundraising letter. <laughs> so, but uh, the book is in print, it's in Amazon. It's, it's really one of my better books. It's called uh, Juicy Ghosts. So this painting, it's, it sort of combines the idea of being upside down and falling with no up and no down in this endless free fall. And then there's some things that relate to what's in the book. People have these halos that look like toruses. If you're a mathematician, of course, a halo has got to be a precise torus. And then there's just this kind of decorative thing of playing cards are interesting because there, there's no up and no down. The, the king or the queen, they're, they're looking at on both sides. Now, uh, this is just a painting that I like a lot. I thought I'd put it in here, but it could, it makes sort of a point. One thing, we could coming back to what is it like to write a novel? What is it like to do a painting? And at first, a kind of superficial thing to say is that well, novels are linear, they have plots, so they're a one-dimensional thing. It's a line of events. And a painting is a two-dimensional pattern, and you see it all at once. So it looks like there's a difference there. But if you think about it a little more deeply, uh, a novel does have, after you're finished reading it, it's a whole pattern, and you've got this sort of space-time thing of all the events that happen, and it becomes sort of like a tapestry, you know, with all the stuff on it painted all around. But uh, 
this is sort of interesting because there's a nice movement going around. This is a traffic circle in Genoa, Italy. And I like the way that people look. I, I, I've always liked cartoons a lot too. And uh, sort of cool. This is another picture where it's not really just two dimensional. There's a, a direction in it. And this again has to do with infinity, which is one of my lifelong preoccupations, the infinity and the fourth dimension. And I wrote a nonfiction book about each of them. I wrote a book, nonfiction book about infinity called Infinity in the Mind. And I actually wrote two books about the fourth dimension. One of them is just called The Fourth Dimension. And here, the infinity, I'm using a trick that M.C. Escher used. He would find a way to tessellate a finite area by having things get smaller and smaller. And in a way, it's a hyperbolic plane because he's doing uh, making things get smaller and smaller. There's more space in there than you'd expect. And uh, I had this on the, I used this on the cover of one of my books. And then as the, I made a Kindle and Apple wouldn't use this picture because it had nudity on it. So <laughs> I had to go and put bikinis on those people. The, uh, now what's going on here? Well, this, I mentioned uh, the thing about how excited mathematicians were when the Mandelbrot set emerged. It's, it's really, it's hard to express how thrilled we were because it was, you always want there to be something physical that's infinite. And the Mandelbrot is sort of physical. I mean, it's, it's an object, something's physical. If you, other various people can go look at it and it's always there and it always looks the same. That's sort of a close definition of something being real. And the interesting thing about it was you could zoom in and keep finding cool new stuff. That's uh, and so that's sort of, it's a guy just in awe looking at it, it's in the sky. It's like God, you know, he sees it. <laughs> now, um, the next one, what is there? Oh yeah, this is another mathematical thing that I got into. After I went to, I spent about, I think six years as a freelance writer. And as I say, I was selling books. It was a very productive period for me. And my wife was working, she was teaching. And, uh, but we had the three kids and it was just, there really wasn't enough money coming in with all the things coming up that needed to be done. And so then I went and got a job at San Jose State. And uh, they said, well, if you like, you can teach computer science. Nobody has a degree in it anyway. So this was in 1986. And I said, all right, I'll give that a try. It can't be any harder than Gödel's incompleteness theorem. You know? so, so I started doing that and I got really interested in, there is this kind of thing called um, cellular automata, which actually you mentioned, but I think that paper was a joke, right? That title, was it, was it serious? I couldn't tell. Well, anyway, the, the, but cellular automata, uh, there, like if you imagine a screen and imagine that every pixel is a computation and they're in parallel and it's sort of like reality. Reality, reality does so much because I mean, if you're interested in computer graphics and you start looking like you're taking a, taking a shower and you look at the light bouncing off the faucets there and the reflected light and the, 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 the mist, it's just such an incredible computation, but the world can do it because it's doing it in parallel. I mean, every bit of the world is keeping up. And cellular automata are computations like that. Now, the best known one of them is John Horton Conway's epic game of life, which people are so interested in. But there's another thing you can do that I learned at some point, which you could, instead of having just a bit in every pixel, you can have a real number in there. And then you can have sort of an analog cellular automata. And this is one of those. And uh, actually Alan Turing investigated some of these uh, at one point in his life. Now this one, uh, I, I, I built some software for looking at analog cellular automata. And if you're interested, you can get it for free on GitHub. But um, I worked at, played with it really for hundreds of hours. You know, that's the thing. If you get into doing things with computers, you'll just just piss away 
unbelievable amounts of time looking at the screen, but then you find something nice, you know, it's worth it. And so I found this thing and I liked it so much. I printed out a picture of it and then I did a painting of it. Now, it's sort of redeeming it because when you take an analog computation, but you do it with a computer, so it's, it's really digital, it's made of pixels. But once you paint it, it's analog again. It's something, something I enjoy about painting, which is a nice writing has this quality. Again, it's bit by bit, letter by letter, uh, computer science, totally digital. But when you paint, it's your palette, it's just messy. You know, there's, there's colors and you're smearing them around. And when I first started painting, I imagined, well, I'll study color theory and I'll study the color wheel and balance things out. And then I found that's really not how you think when you're painting. You're just looking at colors and you have a sense of what looks good and you mix things. And it's just sort of all very much intuitive. And that's, that's I like that a lot. And I think the thing in the middle of here looks a little bit like a seahorse. So that's nice too. Now, uh, let's see. Now, the thing about analog and digital, it's one of these things that really underlies a lot of the world. And uh, here's, we've got an analog woman and a digital man. So it's sort of like the male female difference. He's a funky robot. He's trying to be human, you know, but not quite making it, but he's trying anyway. Let's see. Okay, I still got plenty of time. Now, um, let's get back to mathematics a little bit. I had fun doing this painting because I always like when you see, well, if you see Arabic written, you know, to me, it's, I can't make any sense of the letters or, or Chinese or Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's cool when you see a script that is completely unintelligible to you. And so here I, I wanted to do some unintelligible scripts, but this is like saucer language. And I've always liked flying saucers. So this is saucer school. So they're, they're learning the saucerology. And uh, one, another thing that comes up here, I, I won't go into it too much, but while I was studying infinity, I, got, I went and got my PhD in set theory. And set theory, it was the, the study of different levels of infinity. And the surprising thing turns out to be that there's actually different sizes of infinity. And one of them is the digital infinity. If you take the set of all counting numbers, one, two, three, take that set. And then the analog infinity, if you take all the points in space. And you'd think the average person will say, well, infinity is infinity, they're both the same size. But as I'm sure many of you know, it's possible to prove that the continuous infinity has a strictly larger size. And uh, sometimes I have trouble convincing people of that. And even now I still get letters of people arguing about it, but <laughs> give it up. Okay. So, uh, but anyway, the, another thing, the man who did this discovered the different levels of infinity was called George Cantor. And there is this sort of, Intriguing thing he also talked about, he talked about the absolute infinity. And that's sort of, when people say there's only one infinity, that's sort of what they're thinking about. And by this, he meant something like God, or you might not want to call it God. You can say the one, the cosmos, the white light, the big aha, the absolute infinity. And in European churches, you'll often see a picture like this that's shown here. It's, you know, a triangle with an eye in it. And that's, that's God, you know, that's how they draw him. And a weird thing on the American dollar bill, we have the triangle with an eye in it. It's sort of sad, you know, that it's on money, you know, but not as good. Now, um, that's, I'm gonna get into something a little bit different now. I'm gonna talk about, I mentioned, I sort of promised that you could sort of prove that you can't predict what's gonna be in your novel. So, Let's kind of look at this idea. Suppose you have a lot of ideas and you want to put them into the novel. So here, this is all the things that a dog dreamed about. And we, we, uh, we had a dog called Arf, we were fond of, very fond of. So this picture is called Arf's Dream. And uh, I just did this list a couple of months ago. 
And I gave it to my daughter because she liked Arf a lot. And she had a dog who looked like Arf. So this is Arf's dream. But you could say that writing a novel, there's an aspect of it that is sort of similar to mathematics. And by this, I mean, when you're doing mathematics, you have a theory where you take a bunch of things you've defined and a bunch of axioms, and then you're trying to prove things from them. You're trying to see what comes out of that. Now, when you're doing a, a novel, it's sort of like that. You have some ideas for characters, a scenario, or at least a place, and something happened, something that happened, maybe some event that gets it going. So you kind of have this little world, and then your hope is that then it'll start logically, things will feed out of that. And uh, you'd like to say that I should really be able to predict the whole novel if I just have the setup, it all follows logically. Now, so is that true? Well, we all know it's not true, okay? If you've ever tried to write something, it's not at all clear what's gonna be happening in chapter six and what's gonna happen at the end, very hard to say. Now, sometimes you will just say, okay, at the end, they're gonna be married and the bad guy's gonna be dead, fine. But what's gonna happen in between? And that's, it's very hard to predict that. And it turns out Alan Turing uh, actually predicted that. I mean, he, he proved that. He proved a formal theorem of mathematical logic that if you have any mathematical theory, there's no quick algorithm that will predict whether any given sentence is provable or not. You think, you know, maybe you could say, take, oh, here's something, it looks like it might be a theorem. Now let's just do a little check on it. If it's gonna be, the proof, we're not asking you to know the proof, we're just saying, is it gonna be provable? And Turing said, no, there's no, there's no quick way to do this. It's called Turing's theorem. It's interesting. It's, uh, Mathematical logic is a funny science because a lot of the things that you prove in mathematical logic are proofs that you can't prove something. So it's sort of a frustrating subject, but it appealed to me when I was a, a young hippie. Uh, anyway, this is a, a painting of Turing. There's a photo of him where he looks like this. And the reason it says Skug there is because I wrote a novel about Turing. Now, many of you may know that Alan Turing died very tragically. He uh, supposedly ate an apple that had cyanide in it and it poisoned him and he died. And uh, he was being tormented by the British government for being a homosexual. And that's the feeling, that's why he did that. There are people though who say that Turing didn't really kill himself, he was killed by the British Secret Service. and. Uh, you know, who knows? But what I did in this novel, it's called Turing and Burroughs. I said, well, what if it was the British Secret Service trying to kill Turing, but what if he escaped and they didn't kill him? And the way he escaped was he found a way to grow a copy of his face and glue it to somebody else. <laughs> and then Turing went off and he went to Tangiers in North Africa and William Burroughs, the beatnik writer, happened to be there. And so Turing and Burroughs became lovers. And then they found a way to turn themselves into giant slugs, which are skugs. And they would, you know, joyously make love with each other and went over to the US and started turning other people into skugs. And that was the novel. And that was another novel that I couldn't get published. So some of my best work, you know. So again, I published it myself and I raised money from with a Kickstarter. And what happens eventually, publisher did pick it up. They said, well, this is a classic now, you know. <laughs> it, it's not, you know, criminal, it's classic, you know. So um, anyway, now um, I can't remember why I put this picture in here, but. Uh, I notice in a, I put it into the, the summary of the papers, if you look it up online. And uh, I guess, oh, I remember why I put it in. I, it's because sometimes the thing about a painting, unlike a novel, 
in a, in a novel, you're sort of expected to wrap things up and explain what happened. Now, in a painting, you don't have to do that because it's just like a flash photograph of something. Or it's, I always like paintings where it looks like a, it's an illustration of a moral or a fable. And nobody knows what the fable is. There's, one of my favorite artists is Peter Bruegel, the elder. And there's a few of his paintings that are clearly illustrating some Dutch proverb of the times, but nobody knows anymore what the proverb was. And I just think that's totally cool. And so this is illustrating some unknown proverb. So it's really, they're trying to hail, hail a UFO for a ride. You know, they're, they're trying to get over to Alo University and uh, trying to catch a, catch a taxi. Now, uh, this is another cool picture. And this is, again, the whole thing about the history that goes into a story and the way you try to work it out. This has to do with a, a story I wrote. There's a writer called H.P. Lovecraft, and he wrote a, he wrote an, a really great story called uh, At the Mountains of Madness about some guys who go to Antarctica and they go down and find these, these shafts that go under the ground, these tunnels, and there's these, these creatures living down there and they're going along and they're finding these old weird illustrations. Again, I like these, you know, these mysterious unknown things. And these are like, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, when you have a whole lot of pictures to illustrate something, well, like a comic strip. Okay, or, or, and uh, you'll notice that there's something at the corner they need to look out for. It's, there's going to be a surprise. Okay, now, let me, I, you know, I've lost track of what the hell I'm talking about. These are great pictures, though. But uh, this is a picture when I was cooped up with the, let me just look up here. We were cooped up for so long with that crazy COVID. And um, you you don't get to see, it was so hard not getting to see anybody in reality. That's sort of what I was thinking about when I did this. I sort of, when I'm writing, what happens if I'm writing a story and it's really going well, or if I'm painting and it's going well, when I go outside, I mean, the muse is coming to see me all the time. And when I go outside, I'll start seeing things that relate to what I'm writing about. And it's like synchronicity, it's sort of magical. And probably all of you, are, you're all artists, most of you here. And when the work is going well, things start reminding you and you start hearing things that relate to, you hear, keep hearing just the thing you needed to hear. It's like the word is feet, world is feeding you stuff. And we've been trying to do this with Zoom. This is a Zoom picture, obviously, but it's sort of, I find Zoom unsatisfying because when you see people in person, they're giving you a lot of information that they don't give you on Zoom. They're just micro expressions. There's little things, micro pheromones, very subtle things. But I do like the, the sort of regress here where we've got this woman and see that's the same as that woman. And then behind her, you're seeing out, you're seeing a mirror and it's a mirror that's reflecting a window that's open. So there's all these different realities are tied up in there. That's me on the top with my books. You can see that. Okay, now there's one more topic I wanna to hit on. And uh, I know you're starting to wanna to have lunch, but it's only 1130. So you're gonna to have to listen a little bit longer. So uh, the, the idea of chaos is really interesting to me. Now, before I was talking about mathematical logic, proving that you can't prove things. Well, chaos, in a way it's different, but it's physical. Chaos has to do with the fact that when you look at physical systems, we can't predict what they're gonna do. And um, it really isn't like a logical proof, it's just observing. To me, uh, the simplest thing about, if you wanna see chaos, the simplest thing to do is sit somewhere where you can look at a tree with a little bit of wind blowing on it and just watch what the leaves are doing and watch what the branches are doing. And if you kind of think about it, they're doing something, they're never repeating. 
you could watch it for 10,000 years and it would never be in exactly the same position. There's just so endlessly many ways that the branches can move around and they never stop and they're not working on it. They're not thinking about it, but they're always different. And that's the thing about chaotic systems. Now, sometimes people say chaos means sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And that's true, but that's not the real key part of chaos. Uh, it's not just if you start something in a different way, it goes somewhere else. It just, it doesn't really matter where you start it. The main thing about chaos is once something gets going, it moves around, there's something they call the state space of all the possible ways it can be. And it travels all over the state space and uh, in a systematic way. And that's, uh, that's something I like very much. I, I like systems like that. And I like using the word gnarly. It's partly because I moved to California and uh, gnarly, dude. I, I like the idea of things being gnarly gnarly like a tree root or complicated intricate like the waves surf is gnarly so you can see either gnarly or you can say chaotic now um this is a, a gnarly this again is bringing a lot of my interests together here the Mandelbrot set, one of the things that's so appealing about it is that it's, it's so chaotic, you know, it's, but again, the thing that makes chaotic systems doubly interesting, they're not just random, they're, they have patterns, but they're not slavishly doing them. One way to describe chaotic or gnarly systems is to think of a, a spectrum of complexity. And if something is just repetitive, like a checkerboard or a steady droning note, like a drum machine that goes thump, 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 thump. That's just horrible. How can they play that in cafes all the time? Why do they do that? It's so ungnarly. It's just thump, thump, thump. And then maybe they'll have a squeakle, squeakle, squeakle. You know, what's happened? What's happened to our music? Why are they doing that? It's so boring, such low complexity. Now, on the other hand, you can go too far with the complexity and you can just, you know, have all the instruments playing at once, you know, or static on the radio. You just can't, you can't hear anything. It's just hideous. Now the part we like is gnarly. That's in the middle. It's not too cold. It's not too hot. It's just right. You know, Goldilocks, you know, it's right, right where you want it to be. And uh, all the systems that we like in the world are gnarly life. That's the essence of something being alive. It's not simple, you know, it's not dead. It's not like all over the place. It's like, you don't open the door. You don't look over in bed and say, hi, dear, in the morning. And you're suddenly looking at a cloud of tentacles, you know, or a pile of bricks, you know. But there's some stability. They, they stay the same, but they're always different. And good patterns are like that. Life is, this. so the gnarly things are the good things in the world. And that's if you're doing a novel or you're doing a painting. To me, that's the zone you want to be in. You don't want it to be too easy to predict. And we don't want it to be just completely surreal. Any old thing happens. You can, I mean, now and then it's fun to write something surrealist and just have completely random things happening. And if you're doing a painting, it's also, it's fun to see surrealism sometimes, but at some point, you tend to want to see something a little more with a little more pattern to it. Now here we've got, here's the, this is one of those cubic Mandelbrot sets I was talking about. And we all know that UFOs like to abduct cows. They're known for that. They come down and pick the cows up in the saucer and they abduct people as well. So this UFO is abducting its cow and it's got a woman there and so also at the bottom, see that person, that man looking out? That's me, okay? So this is a self-portrait of the artist abducted by a Mandelbrot UFO. So this is a, and here I love the curves. I love the gnarliness of these mathematical curves. Mathematics is a whole study of what, what kind of curves we can have. Okay, now, um, This is a, 
another nice gnarly place that I went once uh, in Micronesia. I went scuba diving there with my brother and there's a lake, a freshwater lake there where it's, there's a billion jellyfish living in this little lake on a rock island there. And you can like go in there and, well here you wouldn't do scuba, you just do snorkeling. And it's just so amazing. This is the kind of thing, when I see something this cool, then, then I want to write about it because I want to see it somewhere. Uh, it's a way to keep things alive. If something you love, you'll, you'll write about it or you'll paint about it because you want to see it again. And I actually then did a painting of it too, obviously, and this is the painting, the, the jellyfish. Um, okay. How large is the lake? But, Oh, this painting, it's a, uh, most of my paintings is about, the biggest they get is 40 inches by 30 inches. And uh, they're often smaller. The thing is, I live in a, a house, you know, I'd like to have a studio and do four feet by six feet, but uh, I don't really have the physical setup for doing that. So uh, you can see them all online. If you go to rudyrucker.com slash paintings, you can see all my paintings there. And um, yeah, I would like to do a bigger version of this one. Um, now, something else, I want to say one more thing about chaos, and then I'll quit. Um, I said something about the chaos kind of being predictable, what the patterns does, but the patterns are always different. Now, there's a word, there's a whole science called chaos theory, which is sort of cool. I don't know if you remember the very first uh, Jurassic Park movie, and uh, the guy is in there, Jeff Goldblum, says, I'm a chaotician. And says, That's cool. That guy's cool. He's got it together, you know. So uh, chaos theory, one of the things it talks about is strange attractors. So if you have a chaotic system, and there's a certain kind of patterns that it likes to form, those are called the attractors of the system. So in other words, when you go to the beach, you don't see just this un, this diverse cloud, this fog of water drops in the middle of the air, just hanging there. You see waves that have certain patterns. And those are the strange attractors of the surf. It likes to form certain kinds of patterns, and this is what you get. So when you're writing or when you're painting, there turns to be certain kinds of patterns that you like to make. And those become, that's your style, okay? That's the mode that you're in. And these are the strange attractors that you're going towards. Now, it's getting close to lunchtime and people are leaving. So I think let's just cut down to the questions now and uh, we'll do questions for a little while. Okay, thanks for having me here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. For the sake of our yeah. our folks at home. Right. So the question was: uh, Has has Rudy taken any any inspiration from the continuum hypothesis with regards to? Uh, yeah, actually, there's actually a section of this paper that I didn't say, you can see it online. But that was, I mentioned that George Cantor proved that the size of this of the space, the continuum, this the set of all points in space is larger than the number of counting numbers. And then a natural question, well, a natural for some people would be to ask, is there anything between? You know, is, is that the first infinity that's larger? Is C the first thing after Aleph null? And uh, I've thought about that for really a long time. You know, I, when I was a younger mathematician, I, you know, I fantasized about solving it. And I even got to meet Kurt Gödel, the, the famous logician, and talk to him about it. And again, mathematical logic, it's sort of a, it likes to jerk the rug out from under you. It's, it showed that we can't solve the continuum hypothesis. We, we can't answer it. And uh, then I said, oh, well, I'm just gonna write a novel about it. So then I wrote my novel, White Light, 
where a guy goes to another world where he's got a C there and Alf Null and Alf One and uh, all this cool stuff happens. But it's, I was, just, I still think about the continuum problem though. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yes, it's, well, if you say it's unprovable, that means some worlds it's true, some worlds it's false. I generally stay away from novels with multiple worlds. Uh, if at all possible, I don't like to do that because if you have a multiverse, then nothing matters, okay? If everything happens, nothing matters. And to me, I'd rather have there be just one universe and there's some deep, profound code to it. There's some meaning. I'd like the universe to be a well-written novel and to have some, some thing to it. But it's an interesting, yeah, back there. So, so what is the medium of the paintings? Uh, for the first maybe 10 years that I was painting, I used oil and I thought, well, oil is classier and uh, it has a softer color and you can blend. And then I got tired of the cleanup process for oil is, is quite a hassle. And so then I said, well, I'm just gonna try acrylic. And now I've been doing acrylic for about 10 years and I like it because it pops really hard. And uh, if you don't like something in acrylic, you can, you can paint over it 10 minutes later. It's really fast to revise. And slowly I've been learning ways to, there's things you wanna do where you wanna put a, like a screen of color. You wanna have like, you have something done, you wanna put a scrim of color over it, a tint, you know? And it's possible to do that in acrylic, but you have to have some practice to know how to do it. But I could go back to oil anytime. So what are your feelings about VR, virtual reality? Virtual reality? Is that it? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, it's funny. Uh, for a time I was working at Autodesk. When our, when our daughter went to college, she went to Swarthmore. And uh, the first year she went there, that's when I was a freelance writer and I was making, my wife and I were making, you know, a very small amount of money. So they said, oh, you can practically come for free. And then I went to, got a teaching job in California and they said, oh, sorry, it's going to be 40,000 a year now. <laughs> so then uh, I started working at Autodesk, a software company, and they were working on virtual reality. They had something, the Autodesk cyberspace project. And it was really exciting. But uh, a lot of things we thought were going to happen didn't happen. What really happened was it turned in the video games are really where virtual reality is at. That, that's, that's the main application. And it, it's huge, billions and billions of dollars. And uh, I haven't actually, I keep thinking, well, I really got to get, you know, one of these new masks and, and start looking at it. But there's... Uh, I haven't pulled into it that much. Virtual reality in a novel is an interesting theme. I, my novel, The Hacker and the Ants, that was written when I was working at Autodesk in the early days. And uh, I did some cool stuff with VR in that one. So you might check that out. So is, is there a reason that you depict yourself as potentially a younger self in your paintings? Oh, well, sure there I'm is. Not sure to judge. I'm just, I'm I mean, I, I could paint myself as an old man. I mean, I might do that sometimes. Uh, but, uh, well, there's something in your head. You reach a certain point in your life and you sort of, your image of yourself kind of doesn't change very much. I would say it's when you're around 27, you know, that's for the rest of your life in your head, you're 27. So that's, 
and if you're in a VR and a painting is a VR, so why not look like that? You know, but uh, yeah. In, in the speaking of VR in the matrix, they refer to that as residual self image. Yeah. Yeah, the matrix. As another classic VR. <laughs> I shouldn't have brought it. <laughs> so uh, is there significance in the fact that you tend to draw outlines around your forms? Oh, that was actually something my third grade teacher told me. They said, Rudy, you should always outline in black. So. <laughs> and you mentioned you're, you're fond of cartoons. Well, it makes the picture pop. To me, it's very important that you can look at it and just bam, you can see what it is. So I like to do that. So I do like to outline in black, it's true. Uh, and a lot of my pictures end up being seen on screens and it's, it's nice. And also if, if it's in the house and it's not very bright in there, you sort of can't see the picture unless it has sharp edges. I mean, that's what I think, but everybody has their own way of doing it. Okay, well, let's go have lunch and thanks yeah, for so coming out. Let's thank Rudy for a, a gnarly talk. Radical. Uh, I'll just, I'll wrap things up with just a couple of 